In late December of 1957, the Americans were losing the space race. They had to come up with something really quick and they had two choices. Go with them, uh, a project by the Navy called Project Vanguard or try to launch something using an army rocket. They actually decided to go with the Navy project because it was supposed to be uh, based on civilian space uh, rockets. Now, they call this Vanguard TV-3 and this is what happened. It flew for one meter, fell down, exploded and was doomed. It was also known as Kaputnik for obvious reasons because it didn't survive the launch. Now the thing is the actual satellite survived and it was really 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 damaged and unfortunately for the US this was a complete and total disaster. This was humiliating and they had to come up with something else and do it quick. Welcome to What The Math. Welcome to episode 3 of History of Spaceflight and today we're talking about the US space program. So this was the start and this is how it all began. President Eisenhower had to make a difficult choice and unfortunately he made the wrong choice by going with Vanguard rocket which exploded and instead he then realized he should have gone with the army's decision of using an ICBM just like the Russians did and they chose to use a rocket called Redstone. Now in Kerbal Space Program the stock components unfortunately do not provide enough uh, enough diversity for us to create uh, a rocket that looks exactly like a redstone but this is sort of what it had on the surface so it had uh, white and black stripes it was an ICBM and it was staged very very interestingly so on the bottom there was a very very large liquid engine so this was the bottom part then it had not one not two but a stack of 11 different uh, solid rockets solid rockets that kind of were attached together and looked something like this but probably a little bit better looking than that then on top of that it, it had another stage with six more of these guys uh, this is seven but we're gonna pretend this is six and then lastly it had the last stage where there was another one just just like the ones below it and it was just one this was the last stage so it was actually a four stage sort of a rocket and this is what they were planning to launch instead of using Vanguard again because Vanguard clearly failed it was a it was not a very stable rocket it exploded and it didn't really work but uh, it seems like this was a good project because ICBMs uh, based on Redstone were working just fine and army wanted to use those instead now I won't be able to construct anything that looks as beautiful as the actual uh, redstone using stock parts so I just, instead I'm going to be using procedural parts uh, from the procedural parts mod. And the way the procedural mod works is that you choose a tank uh, using the where is it using the procedural uh, thingamajig and then you basically adjust it to what you want it to be and change its coloring and there's even redstone stripes here so we can just use that so we're going to construct that using uh, procedural parts instead and here we go this is Juno 1 rocket based on redstone and this is kind of what it looked like it had sort of a different coloring actually it was just plain white with some lettering on the side but I decided to go with redstone coloring because it made made it look more appropriate and um, it had a uh, liquid engine on the bottom uh, then it had the flaps very similar to V2 rockets which were actually um, almost exactly identical except they had these little protrusions on the side here whereas it, uh, this is where I put my um, controlling elevons as well so that they actually um, control my rocket then on top right in the middle here there was a booster um, which was based on solid boosters like I mentioned before 11 of them then a little bit higher here there were six and then lastly there's one inside the actual satellite which was really really tiny it was actually only about 13 kilograms which is about 30 pounds so it's ac actually it was about six times lighter than Sputnik 1 and it was actually meant to be light because they wanted to uh, try to come up with something really really e effective and inside of this satellite there were several things obviously there was a uh, booster here there was also a very very large battery that allowed it to, to, be, to function for about 30 days actively and then even longer than that passively so it actually I think it lasted almost a year uh, it had four antennas but they weren't really as pretty as Sputnik uh, because they were just kind of four cables, four wires just sticking out. These ones look a little bit better. Once they actually deploy, you'll see. Uh, and lastly, on the inside, it had... Well, first of all, this was the first satellite that used transistors. If you don't know what transistors are, 
uh, look it up. It's what computers are based on. And so this was the first satellite to use those things. It was, I, th I think, had like 28 of them inside. And it had a radiation detector in it, which was supposed to detect cosmic rays, uh, which it actually did, of course. Um, it also had uh, um, this part here, which was essentially meant for meteorite detection. What this was, is, it was essentially um, a mesh of wires, and uh, wires that were electrically charged. And whenever a meteorite struck uh, this part, it would break the wiring and then the, uh, the electrical signal would send uh, the signal back home saying, oh, I got hit by a meteorite. So this is essentially what um, to this was meant to test the amount of micro meteorites that, that was hitting this particular uh, satellite. Um, also inside, inside this part, it had an acoustic sensor, which also sends the actual uh, sound, even though there's no sound in space, but the actual vibration from the meteorite hits just to confirm if this was actually an actual hit or not. And it also had temperature sensors, which were kind of actually rudimentary and not really that important, uh, but it was meant for uh, just seeing if there's any um, any problems on the inside. And lastly, it had um, a cosmic ray detector, like I mentioned, and it was actually called Anton, which I'm really excited about because it, it was named after me, or vice versa. So this is essentially what it looked like and what the, the actual rocket looked like as well. And, um, well, actually, okay, it was a little bit smaller than that. It was actually smaller and thinner, but this was the best I could do in, in uh, Kerbal Space Program. Um, the actual size of this, here's a picture of what it looks like. It was really, really tiny. The rocket, of course, was much, much bigger. Uh, but the actual shape kind of resembled this. So there was a little protrusion here. There's uh, an actual redstone rocket on the bottom. And, of course, the uh, V2 rocket-like flaps that were right here. All right, so let's launch this and see how it goes. And this is what our Juno 1 rocket looks like from the outside on the launch pad. So the Explorer 1 is right here on top, and this is the Redstone-based Juno 1 rocket. Now, before we actually launch it, let's talk a little bit about where did the Americans actually get the technology to construct these things, and why does it look like V2 so much? Well, of course, there was something called Operation Paperclip. Now, this is, if you've never heard about this operation, I, actually, when I when I first heard about it, I was like, really? They did that? So what happened in uh, right after the Second World War was that the American government decided to uh, try to get as many German scientists, even though they were some of them were Nazis, to America because they wanted to use uh, their knowledge, their expertise to construct these beautiful rockets and a lot of other weaponry that they were able to construct for Nazi Germany during the Second World War. But the other thing is that they didn't actually want the Russians to have the technology, so that's why they decided to essentially invite them to the US. Now, many of these scientists were quite innocent, but some of them were actually Nazi scientists and some of them were even responsible for a lot of atrocities. And so that, that was later found out. And unfortunately, a lot of many, many people got in trouble for that. Uh, but uh, even the president of the United States, uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, he actually didn't want many of them in the US. So it was kind of uh, an operation that was slightly illegal to bring them into the US. And one of those scientists was Werner von Braun. Von Braun was the scientist responsible for constructing the V series of rockets. So he was actually the father of V rockets, uh, but he wasn't the father of rocket train. I'm going to talk about this in a second while I'm watching, launching my beautiful Juno 1. So let's copy Explorer file from the motherboard, mother drive, hard drive, and now let's launch it. Run Explorer, and this is a script I kind of very badly written just so that we can actually uh, launch the rocket. All right, get ready for launch, Houston, and let's go. So here we go. Here comes the beautiful uh, January 31st, 1958. It's supposed to be 10 p.m., but you know what? doesn't matter. So it's going to start uh, doing a very, very, very brief gra gravity turn because this is not um, a very, very well-designed rocket, mostly because there's limitations in the Kerbal Space Program. I wasn't able to design it to perfection, but you know what? It's the best I could do. Anyway, so uh, let's keep talking about Von Braun. So he came to the US under the pretense of being, uh, you know, a German wanted to immigrate and he was a scientist, so they, they gave him all the documents he needed and he started working for, uh, um, for the American Army first and then obviously NASA when when it uh, became a thing 
Uh, and so Werner von Braun, um, he developed these rockets, including all of the Saturn rockets, all of the rockets that um, were based on Redstone as well. And it started as a V2-like rocket but then turned into a completely different design, which was very, very effective. Now, these were different from the Soviet rockets because these always started with a liquid engine and then had solid boosters afterwards. So it's kind of, if you think about Kerbal Space Program, it's kind of backwards, right? Normally we put solid boosters first. And this is why in Kerbal Space Program, it was really, really difficult for me to create this last stage that has my solid booster. Now, this is not exactly how it was launched at all, actually. It was probably not, not like that. But this was the only way I could find to launch this rocket so that it actually has a solid booster at the end. And it gets into the proper orbit of approximately 115 kilometers by about 1600 kilometers, which was uh, the Kerbal equivalent of the actual orbit, which was... Um, the periapsis is 360 kilometers and the apoapsis is of about 2,500 kilometers. So it was a very elliptical orbit and it was an inclination of about 30 degrees as well, which is what, what we're going to have here. Uh, but uh, unfortunately for me, it was really, really difficult to to get that right. I, I actually, I, I was having trouble uh, with solid boosters at the end. Uh, and so, yeah, so Vernon von Braun, he... Um, created these and there's a picture of him holding the rocket and he was actually, he almost became a hero in the United States, but obviously countries like the United Kingdom hated the guy because he was responsible for um, essentially destroying most of the London. His rockets, not, not him himself, but his rockets that he invented were responsible for some serious destruction in the United Kingdom. So uh, for that reason, um, Americans kept it a secret for a while and so he wasn't really uh, advertising that he used to be the Nazi. But obviously uh, they knew about it. Anyway, so, um, but why he's not as important and why he's a little bit over glorified is that he actually wasn't the father of rocketry at all. As a matter of fact, when he came... Oh, here we go, last stage. Yay, look at that beauty. Uh, when he came to the United States, uh, he uh, actually said, so why did you even invite me? Why did you ask me to make all of these rockets? Why didn't you ask Robert Hol Godard? Who is Robert Godard, you may ask? Well, actually, Robert Godard is the father of rocketry. He was the first person ever to start making rockets, start launching rockets, and he was asking the US for support and for money for years, for decades. He actually, his first rocket, um, he built in like 1914. That's, that's literally 20 years before Von Braun even came up with his first rocket. And Von Braun actually based a lot of his designs uh, on Godard's work because Godard visited um, Nazi Germany before the war and he actually did get to talk to a lot of the scientists there so they may have actually kind of stole his plans which would not be surprising at all because he didn't really patent uh, them that well and the, th the other thing is that this was during the war so nobody cares about patent during the war and so uh, this uh, he was American prof he was an American professor and he um, he was working on developing all kinds of solid fuel rockets and he demonstrated to the American army actually that they would have made a perfect weapon. And he was actually also kind of the father of bazooka, the infamous bazooka, because he actually showed the American army that, look, you can put this in a tube and it flies in a straight line and then it, you can put a grenade at the end. And so uh, he, uh, he was kind of responsible for making that as well. Um, he also started making liquid fuel rockets in about, I think, around 1921. Um, and uh, unfortunately, none of his rockets really flew that far. I think the highest he had was about two kilometers. Uh, but nevertheless, he was successful. And one really, really, really bad... Uh, thing that happened to him and really that's one of the reasons why he he was never really that popular and why he was never really um he never really made it you know in the rocket business uh for some reason for some unknown reason back in those days before the war the american press loved to ridicule people especially smart people and he was completely ridiculed he, he was destroyed by the press the press oh here we go i have to interrupt myself for a second this is the official launch so i believe it says Yes, we are finally in orbit. Explorers in orbit. Um, we have found Van Allen's belts. Program ended. So this was the final stage. Now, before I talk about that, let's check the orbit. And the orbit is 112 by 1200. Okay, I, I undershot it a little bit. It should be about 1600, but we're almost there. And so while we watch this beautiful design spin, let's talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit more about... Uh, 
the infamous, or not, not so infamous, actually the opposite of that, Mr. Goddard, or Dr. Goddard, I guess. Uh, and so the really, really annoying thing about the American press is that they destroyed his reputation and his confidence. And so because of that, he was never able to convince anyone in the US that he would, you know, that the rockets were great. They, were, they would have been a great thing to have and they would have been amazing. And it took US 20 years and the uh, Second World War to essentially realize that yeah, okay, rockets are cool. The other things that he actually invented were the rocket gyroscope, he invented the uh, the gimballing, he invented that, the fact that the, this engine can actually move by itself, and uh, he essentially invented the, the idea of a rocket. He was the first to even think about it. Oh, okay, that's not true. Chinese did, but he was the first to put it in practice and have uh, a metal tube launched in, into, into air. But what's even more ironic is that even the famous universities like the MIT ridiculed him. They actually ignored his work, they would not take him seriously. But even though this may seem like something arrogant and a little bit uh, unproductive to do, uh, even today some people may have great uh, discoveries and great uh, ideas, but they will still be ignored by universities and by the press if their ideas seem too out of out of ordinary or too extreme. So it's it still happens today as well. So you can imagine how many great discoveries might have been ridiculed to the point where the person would just give up and become really depressed. So this is what happened to Dr. Goddard. And let's watch our beautiful satellite orbit Kerbin. Now this satellite, Explorer 1, uh, was very symbolic, but it did accidentally discover uh, something that we call Van Allen's belt today. Uh, or oh, sorry, Van Allen belt, there's only one. Um, so Van Allen was one of the scientists that actually put that Geiger counter and cosmic ray radiation detector on this satellite and he discovered these, um, these sort of lines around our planet so what is Van Allen belt? Well, it's sort of like concentrated radiation around our planet. And look at that, there's actually sound lights right there, that's awesome. How con convenient is this? And so, imagine it kind of looks like this, but it's really uh, not the same principle. So, it's, um, it's radiation that's trapped around our planet due to our magnetic field that essentially creates this kind of a shell of radi extreme radiation. So if you pass through it, you'll get r exposed to a lot of radiation. So you have to pass really quickly. And what the satellite found is that once in a while, once it would pass through those, um, th those I guess, ribbons, those belts, it would receive su uh, huge amounts of radiation suddenly. Uh, and the reason why it would receive those ra uh, that radiation sometimes and not always is because of its really eccentric orbit. So somewhere around here it would start receiving radi radiation, then it would stop, then it would receive more, and then it would stop again. And so they've discovered these, uh, these sort of belts of high, high radiation, and it was named after Professor Van Allen, so that's why it's called Van Allen Belt today. And the other important thing that this satellite discovered was, of course, the fact that there are micrometeorite collisions in space all the time, and specifically for this meteorite, it received 29 impacts um, per square meter. In other words, it got hit 145 times per day. And that's, just, that's a lot of meteorites being hit by. And so essentially you can imagine that after a few years, uh, actually it, it went down back, uh, it, it re-entered Earth in 1970, so by then it was probably covered by little holes everywhere. But this was a really important mission and it actually started a series of um, satellites called Explorer and in total they had over 90 different scientific discoveries. So this was a very, very important step for uh, American space program and of course NASA. So this is essentially was the first step to formation of NASA. But I think today we really need to remember that it wasn't really Von Braun that invented anything. He, yes, he worked for the US, but it was always Godard that really made a difference. Unfortunately, he died in 1945 uh, because of the health complications, so he never got to see um, any of his inventions make it to space. But if it wasn't for him, we would still be living on Earth and never really experience the beauty of space. And here come the Southern Lights again, and on that note, let's stop this video here, hopefully you enjoyed everything you watched, and if you did, please leave a like and subscribe. There's more videos coming, more episodes to come, and this was episode 3 of the history of space travel. If you enjoyed this video, leave a comment saying what do you think, was Goddard underappreciated, and can you think of any other scientists except for Tesla and Goddard who should have gotten more credit back in the days? Also, check out some of the other Kerbal Space Program videos that I've posted in the link right here. Thank you so much for watching and game you later. Bye bye.